Okay, that's probably enough calming music for now. <laughs> uh, let me unmute everybody. Welcome to... Da, 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 da. Kitchen party, hello. Kitchen party roasted fish edition. <laughs> Um, so yes, if you are, if you are new here, uh, if you haven't seen a Kitchen Party episode before, um, this is a show, a live stream where we, uh, Jared, who is in the, the center here, um, cooks an elaborate recipe that will take about two hours in his kitchen, which is in Seattle, and a bunch of us who are generally not in Seattle, <laughs> through the magic of the internet, hang out in his kitchen and just talk about stuff and watch him cook the thing and see if it turns out or not, because it's usually something challenging that he has not done before. So um, here we have, we have, we have Jared, we have the fisheye. This is a, a technological advance. Uh, Jared has a shiny new camera to best highlight so we can see what he is actually doing. Um, it could be a setting this time. I'm sorry, everybody. <laughs> it's going to be gross. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be it's gonna go through stages some of which are less appetizing than others although the most disgusting part is in the past and jared will have to tell us war stories about it <laughs> rather than actually making us watch anyway <laughs> so who is with us today uh i'm going to start with um a person directly below me on the screen anna and go from like left to right so uh say hello and introduce yourself uh, hi, my name's Anne. I'm not sure how much identifying information I should give out on the internet. Um, I'm a teacher. I live in Brooklyn. Uh, right now I'm staying with my dad in the great state of New Jersey for a couple days. Um, and I was asked if I sort of have any projects or do anything. And I'm like, not really. I, just, <laughs> I, I think we're more going to talk about like stuff we're eating and reading <laughs> and I watching. About that. I have very strong feelings about food and books. Um, Excellent. To, uh, this is wait, the right place. <laughs> this is you've come to the right place. <laughs> uh, Vanessa, hello. Hello, I am Vanessa, and um, I also have strong feelings about things that I eat and read. Uh, so great! I'm I'm glad that we're on the same page about that. Um, and I know you told us to think of how we were going to introduce ourselves, and <laughs> I read that and acknowledged it and didn't do it. But um, I can say that I've been an archivist uh, and a social worker, and my current obsessions are golden age detective fiction. So that's what I'm going to be talking about in terms of books mm -hmm. and uh, Victorian recipes. So, oh my God, <laughs> um, that's that's what I've been. But only like simple things. I'm not doing like elaborate nine course meals that involve like twelve different types of uh, pig or things like yeah. that. But, yeah. But and where uh, are you? Oh, I'm in Toronto. Hi. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Diane, hello. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm Diane. I'm also in Toronto. Uh, and um, I guess if anybody saw the the tweet uh, advertising this kitchen party, uh, I'm a journalist. More specifically, I'm an associate producer at the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, which is Canada's national broadcaster. One of many faces behind the scenes in our news department that helps try to bring the news to people. Uh, <laughs> 24 seven, uh, although right now I'm not working in news. Uh, I suppose the project that I could talk about that I'm working on, um, cause I don't have any personal projects on the go at the moment. Um, we're doing a project for our uh, Being Black in Canada unit. Uh, and we usually bump up our um, programming in February, Black History Month. So we're working on a, a video series that's going to be coming out very shortly. Fingers crossed, we're still sort of frantically working on it. Um, in terms of uh, food and books, I, I don't know if I have as strong opinions or as strong skill sets as the other <laughs> guests here. Although I will say that food and cooking, I think has been one of those weird things that's become a main theme because of the pandemic. I did a lot of cooking during mm -hmm. the pandemic, which I think also helped me, you know, retain some sanity <laughs> during this mm -hmm. time. Um, books, we'll see what happens. I, I usually am an avid reader, but 
just lately with work, I just haven't gotten to a good book. I think the last good book mm-hmm. I wrote uh, in the fall, returning from uh, a work-related uh, assignment. So I just think that was the last book I read almost cover to cover in the sitting. So. <laughs> I feel like between like the stuff that you're doing and the stuff that we're reading and stuff that we're reading, we've got we've got plenty to talk about and we we will get to that. But first, I'm going to put I'm going to see if I can put Jared in the in the hot seat. Um, so he can explain to us what what are you doing and what is <laughs> what is the backstory to this? What is the terrifying part that has already been completed? Tell us Ugh. about this. <laughs> Um, I am making porovtsuk, which is a stuffed Armenian fish. It's supposed to be a sea bass, but I'm doing a bronzino today, which I have never eaten. So there's a lot of firsts today. Uh, the other first that already happened off camera, because this is the kind of thing that you don't <laughs> want to just invite people and spring on them, was gutting the fish, because I did not ask the fishmonger to do that for me. <laughs> and I regret that very much. Now you um, know. Part of the now I part. know. Um, I am still a little shaken. <laughs> it was gross. It, I had it never done this the before. Trauma. The most disgusting meat-related thing I'd ever done was just like pulling giblets out of a chicken. You know, everybody, that's just a thing people do. But this was like knife there, and... There uh, shook. <laughs> oh, it was gross. Fish guts. Um, Describe the fish guts. Were there like identifiable <laughs> organs in there? Or was it just like a, a mass of slime? Okay, so... <laughs> this is not something I should really admit, but I was not really looking while I was, you know, <laughs> using the knife <laughs> because it was upsetting. Um, I had rubber gloves on and everything. I had to like put my hand in and just like, um, oh, Ned, Ned I regret already. so much that I had eaten breakfast before doing. <laughs> so I feel bad. Um, I. I feel very bad for what I've done to the fish. I know it was already dead. It doesn't care, but I feel bad. And I'm going to eat it. So, you know, people are always stuff like, it. Stuff I'm going to stuff it. it. I'm going to commit more <laughs> acts of violence against it. and <laughs> Offering um, an indignity to the body of a fish. Yeah. You know, people are always, not not everybody, but some people are like, oh, you, you, know, you, you have to like be comfortable with where your food has come from and how it gets to the point where you eat it. Usually you're talking about meat or whatever. Like if you're not comfortable with seeing the killing, are you comfortable with eating it? Um, you know, one of the reasons we live in a society is that people, <laughs> someone who, else can people who don't it. mind that kind of thing can do that. And then I can just <laughs> get a styrofoam tray of fish and eat it. I don't need to do this part <laughs> myself. Anyway. So this is a stuffed Armenian fish. Um, we Armenians are apparently very big on stuffing things with other things um for new year's i made a stuffed chicken which was amazing so i'm hoping this is going to be good too we live in a society um so i'm going to preheat the oven and the first thing that i've got to do is actually start making the stuffing which involves cooking some onions and pine nuts and things so okay. i'm gonna get started on that so yeah so tell, tell us it's got onions and pine nuts and what else what else is it gonna onions be pine nuts currants um so- dill where's my cutting board it's not so much it's not a fish stuffed with something it's not going to be like, like a fish duckin or anything like that it's no 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 <laughs> no it's just going to be a sort of a mush oh breadcrumbs oh, yeah. yeah it's, oh, it's kind, it's, kind it's, of like a turkey stuffing basically a little bit um but it's not pieces of bread so i have a question about the guts yes uh, so do you, did you have to like look up how to gut the fish correctly or were you yeah. following some kind of YouTube video or something or were you just yeah. like, I could probably figure this out? No, I pulled up. So we're really starting off classy here, but I pulled up a bunch of videos to look at and all of them were like, now insert the knife tip into the anus and <laughs> slit upward. And I was like, Dear God. come on, I don't want to know what I'm doing. I just want to. Well done. <laughs> I don't want to know what these parts are. That makes it worse. Okay. Cool, you cool. made it That's weird, cool. cookbook. <laughs> yeah. No, it was so one of the one of the most helpful videos actually was this like old British lady who was like, now stick the knife into the bum hole. I I, anyway. I was gonna say I have British in-laws and um they will come up with fascinating euphemisms. For like what? Well, bum hole is one, um, though that is a bit too rude. But uh, my mother-in-law actually, her, her, the height of her swear words is fiddlesticks. 
And that, that is really something. It's, it's like, uh, yeah, sort of like Mary Poppins from time to time. It's really mm -hmm. pretty. <laughs> that, is, that is delightful. I learned a really I remember, good I, one last week. Sorry, mm -hmm. sorry, Nadia. No, I was just going to say, I, I remember having a high school history teacher who would, would quite seriously and with irony use the word fiddlesticks. <laughs> and then just thinking that that was... That's, a, that's not a word that anyone really uses enough anymore. Sorry, go on, Vanessa. <laughs> uh, well, I'm, I'm going to bring it to Golden Age Detect Fiction immediately because uh, that's the connection. Um, so I belong to this book club that I joined before the holidays. And um, it has like an old style form, you know, like where you post stuff and whatever. And one of the most popular threads is um, words from Golden Age Detective Fiction that you don't know what they are. And hmm. one of them... Oh, yeah. That is haha. Is what? Ahaha. Ha. Uh -oh. Like the water feature? Mm -mm. Uh, is it dirty? Is it like it's not water? dirty. No, you would assume <laughs> that it would be dirty. <laughs> uh -huh. No. So it's actually, does anybody know what it is? I thought okay. I did. Uh, me too. Actually, <laughs> I know maybe, one definition. But... Maybe, maybe it is the same thing as what you're thinking of, Jared, but it's basically like the British aristocracy's version of an infinity pool for their lawns. Yeah. So it's like a ditch. Wow. With the, and, oh, and I have so heard it's, this. Yeah. It's a way of making sure that you're, you're the view of your, of your empire, essentially. Um, is not interrupted by a fence or anything like that. So, but your your uh, your cows and sheep and whatnot can't escape. So they can go out and graze, but they can't get past the the ditch or. It's a kind of a bougie ah. moat, basically, <laughs> like yeah. a middle class moat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, we have uh, Ned saying, "Oh no, he he said uh, getting ideas for bad punk band names here, ladies <laughs> and <Yeah>. gentlemen." <laughs> 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 And Nelson, that is the other it. person that I like, the only person I can think of who would unironically use the word fiddlesticks. <laughs> <laughs> see, see, that's where I thought this was going. That's what I thought too. <laughs> but the ha ha is for when the peasants fall in the ditch. And I've actually been, been, well, I, I've actually been yelled at by a member of the British aristocracy, and that was a really exciting moment for me. Uh, oh my god! Were, I'm well, so jealous. Yeah, she wasn't really a member. She was like married in. Um, she's adjacent. Yeah, but she was technically she had like some kind of title, and we were visiting the stately home. And my in-laws have like lifetime memberships to the National Trust. You can get into all these properties for free. <laughs> and so we went there, and we're with friends of ours, and we both had our babies with us at that time. Our kids were like really small, and we just kind of put down a blanket and toys and stuff, and the kids were playing on the ground and woman comes out and just starts going off about you know this she's in a wheelchair she's quite old she's with her very folks and she's like this is my property and you can't have a picnic and uh our, my friend who's 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 pretty um i guess bulky would be the term that he'd use in england he was like no we paid our entrance free which we didn't but you know <laughs> um, like, and so he's like no we paid and we're here and she's like you're having a picnic and anyway they got into it and then um she said i wouldn't let my grandchildren do this and he said well you're a miserable old cow <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> i really i wouldn't even try to do the accents involved but it was it was a really oh it was a spectacular moment i was so i just wow. had to leave because i couldn't, wow. I couldn't cope with the, the accents and the situation and you know and, I, and i'm jewish and i was like i don't know what's gonna happen here i don't want to be in the middle of a class war <laughs> right uh, yeah it was, it was a remarkable moment of just i'm very proud of that um, well done <laughs> I was not not mind taking mind. it, just not having it from the aristocracy. <laughs> He's not somebody <laughs> keeping it PG here. Yes. <laughs> Kids do not have to leave the Ow. room, but we should have babies with us. But yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> oh my lord. Oh, so I was much. gonna. I just. I was reminded of something, Vanessa, when you said. Um, Words in gangster novels or, or like uh, golden age crime novels that no one uses anymore. I was reading something and it wasn't a gangster novel. It was, um, uh, I was down a Google rabbit hole. <laughs> I was reading like an article in a magazine from the mid 1930s that was about like true crime, crime fiction. And there was uh, something was compared to a gangster's pineapple. Mm. And I spent <laughs> quite a bit of time trying to figure out what that was. <laughs> 
I can't wait to find out what, what is it. I can't wait to find out <laughs> this. Vanessa, you're, you, you might, if you'd like, immerse yourself in this, have a guess. <laughs> Gangster's pineapple. <laughs> I'm using it as soon as I yes. find out what it is. Chris has it, Chris yeah. has it in, the, in, the, uh, in the comments, so I will. <laughs> I mean, it must be, it must be a weapon, maybe? No. Was it like one of those, see. I want to say, you know, those like a, uh, you ever see that weapon with the the spikes and it's on the end of a chain and you're like, I don't know. Yeah. I'm just thinking because I'm think akin to the spikes on spiky outside of a pineapple. Maybe that's wrong. I am I'm no trying idea. to think of like a like peaky blinders or something like that. <laughs> uh, man, I have no idea. So Chris has it and I'll put it up. Hand grenade. Specifically like a homemade kind of like DIY hand grenade. So <laughs> it kind of looks like a looks like a pineapple like a yeah. spiky oh, thing yeah. that makes that sense. Will explode and kill you so <laughs> were pineapples one of those things i feel like the british aristocracy probably had greenhouses where they could grow exotic fruit and things like that i wonder if pineapples it, it, were part of yeah. there in the 18th century if you got one you would sort of keep it on your mantelpiece for a really long time and kind of show everybody what it looked like mm -hmm. until it fell apart and rot and then you were like <laughs> ah, perfect and be like these are disgusting and it's like you Space. You could rent a pineapple. You, like, you, you, you could rent them, couldn't you? If you, you were could like, rent a pineapple? Yeah, because you know it, it was a symbol of like wealth and hospitality and stuff. So you would yeah, just get one yeah. for the evening and be like, look, I'm rich enough to have pineapple and then give it back. It's an exotic thing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 Well, like, they're not, I, this is what I was thinking. Yeah. Yeah. They're not the most like user friendly of fruits. I was. No. <laughs> I've gone online. I've, I've I've looked for a lot of like you know those videos of like this is how you can make a pineapple and cut it up. And I've looked at a bunch of those, and none of them have worked for me. Mm -hmm. There is well, one. So Chris says, "What's her name?" And I don't remember her name. Oh, it's Rose. Ro Rosalind, oh, Rosamund Pike. Rosamund, Rosamund Pike. Pike. Jared, yeah. you posted this on our on our on our. Oh, Slack. I did. There's a yes. video of, of Rosamund Pike. Uh, she's she's like she 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 she's like starts the video and she's like okay i'm bored i have to make a, a phone call but because of the time difference i have to wait like three hours so i'm gonna attempt to dismantle pineapple by hand <laughs> and she's rosamund pike is she was in uh gone girl and yeah she's in this uh what is it wheel of time right now that a lot of people yeah. not me are watching but yeah so she she has like she like it's like <laughs> this process of her trying to remove apparently she was like apparently so someone told her that you can like poke in the bottom bit and then like remove the outside bits and That's it will part. actually come apart in these beautiful perfect chunks and it actually worked she actually did this it was it didn't really work. So, right, so basically the pineapple's right. butthole is what you're saying yeah well yeah. that's what she calls it too she calls yeah. it the, yeah the oh, butt nice. plug. <laughs> uh offering a bounty for anyone could, who could bring her a mango <laughs> steam don't those, don't those things stain mango steams? I read that somewhere. Do. I don't know. The skin is really, yeah, it's like super, yeah, it's super like dark purple, purple juice or something. Those are really mm -hmm. good. I need to have one again. I don't know what that is. <laughs> I've never had a mango steam. I wonder if I can it like. I think they're, up an image of they're a little bit like lychees, where they've got a tough yeah, outer coating, and then you get inside. There's this pale white yeah. kind of flesh. Yeah. Oh, I love lychee. Yeah, they're these little bulbous, fleshy bits, and they're very yeah, tasty. They're good. Free. Did you even get your hands on one? Is one of those. So things. has anyone? <laughs> has anyone ever like, I don't know, skinned a caribou or anything? Has anyone done anything really upsetting with food before they had to eat it? I mean, I can like, I, I've killed and butchered a chicken. A witch? Really? Yeah, that's the process. Sorry, uh, I didn't hear. I didn't hear what you killed and butchered. Chicken. Oh, a chicken! Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. How did you how did you dispatch of the chicken? What, did you, what um, method did you use? Knife, and then you have to kind of dip it in boiling water to get all the all the, and then you have to pull out all the feathers, and then you can kind of there's this like kind of weird like carapace on the feet, and then if you dip it in boiling water, you can just peel that off, and you can fry the feet, which is very tasty. Um, and then you kind of have to just it's actually like butchering a chicken's really not that hard because it's small mm. and it's really obvious where it comes apart. Um, you know, and that's, yeah, that, that sounds a little weird, but I mean, honestly, like chickens, like they're, yeah, they're, they're not like world beating brains. I didn't feel that bad about it. I'll be honest. <laughs> it tastes really good. The thing with chickens is I feel like, you know, if our sizes were reversed, they would totally do the same thing to us without oh, yeah. any, any compunction, compunction they're, whatsoever. So. <laughs> they're maniacal 
creatures. Um, but yeah, so I mean, that's that's as far as I've gone. I'm I'm pretty. Uh, I, I, I I'd say I'm pretty unbothered, but I don't eat like pork or you know I don't eat various meats, and I, mm-hmm. I don't think I could take anything. I don't think I could take down anything bigger than a chicken. But. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and and uh, Truce says <laughs> it's very small. It's a pack of way rooster. <laughs> well, yeah. I would have stopped it. Blah blah blah. Rooster soup for dinner. Yes, eat, eat or be eaten <laughs> with the chickens. Oh my god. Tiny attack dinosaurs. <laughs> so is it like I did when you when you pluck the chicken? So you you dip it in boiling water first to loosen the feathers. Yeah, and then do they just kind of like come off, and then they'll come off much more easily. But it, but you have to you have to put it in hot water, otherwise you're like really stuck, and you know. Hmm. And it, it just it's I mean it's so delicious, like it's hmm. so good. And you know, <laughs> it's, oh, anyway, um, you know, and then like uh, I guess. It, you know, the, the classic sort of Jewish tradition that you do for Passover is you buy a carp and keep it in the bathtub for a couple of weeks and feed it. And so every Jewish child of like my grandparents' generation you know, has this trauma of like, there was a carp and we fed him and he was really cute. And then mom <laughs> and killed him and we had him for Passover dinner. They do a children's book about it. <laughs> But I never personally had a, a carpet the basket situation. My mother would not have would not have had a fit. I do um, remember when I now when I was little, I grew up in the Ottawa Valley, uh, which is like the, the sort of rural area outside of Ottawa, um, in a small town, so it was kind of semi rural. And I had friends who lived on hobby farms or small farms. And I remember we knew this uh, we knew this family, and they had they had a lamb. Uh, and they had a daughter, their daughter was like five years old at the time. And uh, the, they, they, they had this lamb and they named it Ulysses and she would, she would play with the lamb and stuff like that. But it was, it was purchased to be, you know, to be butchered. Uh, and uh, I remember like visiting and seeing her playing with the lamb. And then I was back a few months later and I said, uh, um, oh, uh, uh, Charlotte, where is Ulysses now? And she said, oh, he's in the freezer. <laughs> <laughs> it's just farm kids not phased by this. <laughs> not at all. Uh, in my hometown, there's like a tradition. There's like a group of people, or I don't know, not a tradition, but there was like a wave of people who moved there in the 70s from various places um, to a rural area to like, you know, connect with the land and whatnot. I feel like we're probably experiencing that uh, that kind of wave currently as well. Um, and my parents were among them and they got a hobby farm and they tried to raise veal. Um, (laughs) but they, first of all, veal are adorable. Um, so that was a problem and they didn't really know how to do anything. So they just would, they would just like let them wander around and got like pretty connected to them. And then, but they were also, uh, poor and they were planning on, making money off selling them yeah. and um you know so they tried to <laughs> I hope I'm remembering this story correctly I wonder if my mom will watch this and be like that's not the way it was at all um but so they so they butchered their veal but because they had been feeding them whatever and they just let them run around and get strong and young like teenagers <laughs> not only was they, did they experience the trauma of having to kill what were essentially their pets um they were also awful because oh. veal, it's like muscle in veal. It's not is, supposed to be muscly. No, That's it's kind supposed of the point. to be yeah. like tender and delicious. Oh. But because they had given them like satisfying lives, <laughs> like, <laughs> short lives, uh, they were also basically no good for the eaten. So oh. it's a real, it's a real disaster. On every that week. is just yeah, a lose lose situation. Yeah. Uh, Jared, uh, Rebecca can relate to your your gutting fish gutting situation she says i have cut the head off a fish and gutted it wretched the whole time so yes there's so many unexpected textures (laughs) (laughs) like when you're getting the gills out i thought they were soft they're not it's like a comb it's like a bunch of plastic combs and you have to like get oh it was yeah they're they're unpleasant to deal with huh yeah huh I'm not convinced I got everything out either, so we'll see. <laughs> I really didn't want to keep looking at it, so I just like I'm done. <laughs> it's over, right? I don't feel anything else. Did you rinse it or anything? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, okay. Nice. And I did probably this, like You're descaled fine. it, which I didn't realize would send scales flying all over my kitchen. <laughs> mm. 
So yeah, the cleaning part, the getting the scales off the outside. Yeah, I know so much more now than I did yesterday, and I'm gonna try to forget all of it as soon as possible. <laughs> This knowledge, knowledge no one should have. I mean, I oh feel like God. it's probably pretty, like, I, maybe you'll use that knowledge again. Maybe. Honestly, yeah. I you mean, know, when civilization collapses and I was I'm having say, to forage or whatever, then I can... <laughs> we will need your butchering skills. Fishing, yeah. hunting, plucking chickens, killing chickens. One of the videos I watched was this guy just, like, hanging out on a riverbank, and he was like, now take your hunting knife and, like... <laughs> And then like he like peeled it, he peeled the skin off, like inverting it like a glove. Ooh. And I was just going, I'm never gonna be at that point. I'm glad you're having fun. But <laughs> and he was like tossing things into the creek for other fish to eat and stuff. And I was, well, you're one with nature. I'm so happy for you. <laughs> but love that for you. I'm not like, yeah, love that for you. Love that journey, but <laughs> in yeah, was like, what with the love. Is of, of living in Brooklyn is if there is an apocalyptic situation, like we're just going to be out in the first wave. Cause I'm like, I'm very lazy, you know, and the idea of scrabbling to rebuild civilization. I'm like, that, that seems like a lot of work, you know? And I'm, yeah, exactly. I'm like, oh, I don't want to do that. You know, can I, can, can I <laughs> done? you know, I love I have no skills. I can't drive. Uh, I can't yep. split wood. Right. I can't build anything. I can't sew. Like really zero zero survival yeah. skills whatsoever. Yeah, <laughs> they shut the water off in my building for like a day, and I was like, must you know hoard water and like I had, I had like several giant things of water stored away in advance, and I was like, what if I how do I even flush my toilet? Like, what is this? how do I how do I deal with this? And yeah, I just I uh... guess I do know how to use dry shampoo. Like, I guess that maybe that's a survival skill. I bet you could work that. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I have a, I have a my home security system is a machete and a baseball bat. Um, but, you know. <laughs> okay. okay. Do you okay. live do you bad. live in part of Brooklyn where there are people have backyard chickens? Is that a thing? Uh, not really. And I live in a very safe part of um, and I sort of I, my husband did not want he's he's a much more like smaller person than I am. So he was like, Do you have to have the machete? And I was like, we we do yeah um it makes me it's a very powerful piece of for nonverbal communication and <laughs> it's yes, I have, I have to hide it um it's known as Sabbath of Christie that's not my joke um but anyway <laughs> sorry its name is Tabitha Christie is that what you said Christie. <laughs> <laughs> not my joke actually. It's amazing <laughs> but uh yeah or oh, Sally is the other one. <laughs> Jared, how is it going over there with the you're stirring something? Yeah, so you have to um, cook the onions down a little bit and then add the pine nuts and let those color a little bit. Um, so it smells really good in here right now. Hmm. Um, not as much like fish guts as it did earlier. There you go. Yeah. Oh, I didn't um, even think about the smell. Yeah, it was, yeah, it's not that bad. I know. I, I, as I have already said, I'm just a giant baby, and I know that. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, you cook, you cook all the stuffing stuff together, and then it has to cool, and then you put it into the fish and then bake it. Okay. So, have you have you eaten bread this before? No, I, I haven't. Hmm. No, I there's a lot of stuff I wish I'd grown up with that I'm having to rediscover as an or discover for the first time, I guess, as an adult. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those things. I googled Armenian fish dish, and apparently there's a, a traditional, um, there's an Easter dish that is traditional. And there's also a dish, uh, there, there's a particular kind of trout taken from a particular lake in Armenia that is considered yeah. a delicacy. Yep. <laughs> Probably might be hard to source in Seattle. A little bit difficult, yes. <laughs> Well, while you're doing that, I feel like now might be a good time to ask Diane about to elaborate on what you were telling us earlier about your projects. The uh... sorry, right. <laughs> just... no, <that's> okay. <laughs> so, so we have a unit within CBC now be called uh, "Being Black Can I can't even speak. Being Black in Canada, which basically uh, we do throughout the year projects, or we. Um, we feature stories uh, featuring Black Canadians from across the country. Uh, mm -hmm. And so 
this particular video series I'm working on, we're looking at uh, six Black Canadians who immigrated here from the diaspora. And we're basically talking to them about their journeys, like when they got here, you know, what it was like when they first arrived, their, you know, their, their um, either challenges or successes in trying to adjust to a new culture, to a new life. Uh, and then sort of we, we're doing like a little bit of a timeline sequence mm. for those videos on mm. YouTube. Um, and basically it takes us to sort of present day, you know, where they are in terms of their careers and the successes that they've had. Um, so we're doing six of those videos and they're gonna be coming out in early February, I believe. So we'll start, we'll start seeing them on either, um, if you have a CBC News Network, if you're Canadian happen to be watching this, or CBC's streaming service, Gem, they'll be um, hmm. actually showing those. So we'll be doing the individual videos, but hopefully at the end of the month, there'll be like a, a half hour program showing all six uh, of the videos featuring the people hmm. we've spoken to. So. Nice. So what exactly, I know that you, you, you mentioned you're a producer, you're behind the scenes. What exactly are you doing? What is your role in this? Well, in this, what do you do day to day? Uh, well, you mean just in general or with respect to this specific <laughs> I, I was thinking respect and respect to this, but also generally, like, what is the, what is the life of a CBC producer? <laughs> <laughs> uh, what is the life? I mean, uh, so I guess with respect to this project, I mean, I'm using skills that I would normally use if I were, you know, doing a news story, which basically is like finding the people, like basically chasing, like, which is basically finding the people that we select for the project, talking to them, getting a sense mm -hmm. of, you know, their stories and why we want to talk to them. And then we, it's a lot of like coordinating interviews because I work in TV, which is, you know, around considering the, the amount of uh, uh, changes that have happened in the last 20 years of technology and whatnot, like, yeah, um, interviewing them and then basically helping like my colleague who's sort of the lead producer on this, um, you know, helping them find images because we're doing um, because we're telling their stories and it's not the typical news report where you might see a reporter um, helping sort of expedite the story. It's them telling their stories in their own words. So when we edit together, it's them mm. through their voice telling their story about how they got here. Nice. Um, and, and we're sort of marrying that with photos from their life or videos of them uh, uh, from their life and what they do. Mm -hmm. um, I, so, I like I mean, that. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say, I like that approach of like, rather than having a voiceover explaining everything to, and I know it's harder to do sometimes, but to actually like use people's own words and just, just kind of like let their story breathe and kind of hear how they express themselves. I often find a lot more interesting. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I'm sure it's a bit of an exercise for people because they're just trying to live their lives and they're like looking ahead. So it's like to ask to have a stranger out of the ask them, so what was it like back then? Like, can you remember when you first got here or can you remember yeah. like the times when it was difficult for you or did you have any difficulties adjusting or did you experience racism or, you know, mm. it's not stuff you want to dwell on, which I totally mm. understand because you're looking ahead. Like you're at a different place from where you were 10, 12 years ago and you're probably having success or seeing the fruits of your labor and trying to... Um, establish yourself, yeah. but also establish your career or the thing, the passion that drives you. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm sure it's a bit, a bit weird when somebody's like, hey, can we like mine your life for pictures? <laughs> <laughs> no. And we don't mean yeah. it like that, right? Because it's it's a celebration of what they've done. Yeah, yeah, their achievements. So yeah. Is it like, how do people react? Like, when you ask them, when you approach them. <laughs> well, the funny thing is, like, I, I find one of the techniques I try to use sometimes when I'm looking for people, I put out, like, uh, notes on social media, say Facebook, for those who still use it, mm. uh, or even, like, in this case, I went to LinkedIn, and we got so many responses to people. So it was a lot of, like, you know, I, I wrote it out, and it's like, hey, I want to take part of your project. And then we have to sort of, like, talk to them more, unfortunately, and weed them out because... You know, we're looking for people who immigrated here and they were like, well, I'm the child of immigrants. I'm like, well, it's not quite what we're looking for. But I mean, we back for a year round um, unit now. We don't, they don't want to rule them out because they have interesting stories that could pop up in another sort of context. Because mm -hmm. everybody, everybody has a good story. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? So, um, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> were there, are there, I don't know if you can talk about this, are there, um, stories that really have stood out to you from the people that you've talked to like that, that surprised you like it's so funny because the, the thing that i find hard as somebody who talks to people for a living and asks them about their life is that you have to select 
and it's not my ultimately my decision. It's sort of like in my decision is being sort of overseen by somebody a little bit higher up the chain than right. I am. Mm -hmm. So the, a lot of the people that I spoke to before we made our final selection processes, their stories I found were so interesting mm -hmm. um, in terms of like why they got into their fields and like it, it, it can even be something that sort of stemmed from their interests and passions as a child before they like ultimately pursue what they wanted to pursue. Like just talking to them, talking to them about like, you know, you hear about the people in their lives, like their family members, for example, and that may be a, a background influence, or it may just very well be something where they were going down one path and then something happens and then they just, hmm. it, it, it kind of took them in a different direction. Mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's so hard. I don't think people understand how hard it is. It's not like we just ruthlessly like pick, this is what we want, this is what we want. Because for the six people we picked, there's another like 15, 20 people I've talked to yeah. that I have fascinating stories but yeah. we just couldn't use them for this specific project yeah I don't envy having to make that choice because yeah anytime I've done I've done like a few interview type projects and I just find everything interesting and want to use everything I mean <laughs> maybe that makes me too precious for this job because you have to be a little less precious but it's hard when you're talking about people in their lives right? yeah yeah mm -hmm. so, and that goes for anything not just this project yeah 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 uh-huh can I can I ask you because I they, I've talked to you in the past. You were working on a project for a while that this kind of reminds me of, which was uh, like another arrival story about um, a family member of yours uh, that you had some information about. And you were trying to track down more, and it was just it was frustrating you. The trail was going cold. <laughs> yeah, I, I like I in this story. I feel like I'm the Captain Ahab, and this person is like my Moby Dick, and I don't know if I'm ever going <laughs> to get to the bottom of it for literary reference. So I have this great aunt um, on my mom's side. And so she's a bit of a the family legend on that side in the sense that nobody really knows what happened to her. Ever since I was younger, my mom would often talk about this aunt that she was trying to find who she heard had come to Canada. But she, at the time she didn't know. And when she came to Canada, she thought she was here in Toronto and she called a few of the people with the same name in the phone book couldn't find her, doesn't know what happened to her. Hmm. And so I hear these stories from time to time as I got older. And then it really hit me about, I guess it's like going on almost eight years ago when my dad passed away because, you know, going through that period of grief, I think one of the things was maybe anger and annoyance because he was a very quiet guy and he never hmm. really talked a lot about his life. And for some reason, while thinking about that, I thought, well, I was, I was reminded of the story about my mom's aunt, my great aunt. And I'm like, well, I'm a journalist. I do research for a living. Like, why not give this a go and see if I can figure mm -hmm. anything out? This is like back in 2014. Mm -hmm. so in the spring of 2014, I started trying to figure out where this woman, who, this, well, a little bit more about this woman, but who, like, what happened to her? Like, where did she go? And so just by sheer mm -hmm. coincidence, I was doing research because my mom said, well, she left, uh, I think before I was born, because she wasn't here when I was growing up. And we're from... Jamaica originally. I was born here, but my family's from Jamaica. So it turns out that my I had this great aunt who, at the age of 20, got on a ship and made her way to Montreal and arrived here in 1929. So that I found out like through searching archives. Like there's very little information on her, but I found her name and I found, you know, when she arrived. My mom didn't even know this. So mm -hmm. this sort of set in motion me trying to figure out, okay, so she came to Montreal in 1929, then what happened? Yeah. So it, it took me months of trying to, I, I didn't have anything, a lot to go on, just like my mom's stories. At one point mm. I even um, visited, I think the year after I went and visited her last surviving sibling who died a couple of years ago. I just happened to decide to make, a, uh, make the decision to visit some family who I hadn't visited in over two decades, but also see if they knew anything about this mystery aunt that nobody wanted to talk about. So... It, I mean, ultimately, I'm still trying to figure out what happened to her. Like the trails yeah. since her cold. Like I haven't been able to find any records for her. Mm -hmm. I don't even know what she looks like. My mom has seen a mm -hmm. picture of her. The picture has disappeared into the ether. So I don't even know if it's long since, you know, hit a, a, a trash heap or maybe it's in somebody's house wedged in somebody's <laughs> like chest of drawers in Jamaica somewhere. But like, it's, it's still a mystery and it bugs me yeah. because I'm like, if I could do this one thing for my mom and in a way for myself, like figure out what happened to this woman. Like she does not want to be found. Yeah, yeah. So every so often I think about it and I'm just like, I, I apologize if I cuss. I'm like, this fish doesn't want to be found. She really doesn't. <laughs> I, think I can think of. 
<laughs> like weird random threads to see if it leads me to something and I cannot get at it. Oh. Huh. It's so tantalizing because you have this little bit of information and like you know the information is out there and yet <laughs> it's sort of like you hit this wall. Yeah, it was like I started with a little bit of thread and I found a little bit more and a crumb here and a crumb there. Like, so I had more crumbs than I started with. Yeah, but yeah. But there's no end point. Like, I don't know if she stayed in Montreal uh, mm -hmm. where the myth that she came to Toronto came from. I don't know where she died. I don't know when she died. And like mm -hmm. now there's no to really tell me because because all of her siblings are gone. So. Do you, if you want, you can like uh, ask, I don't know how many people are watching this or where they are or whether anyone would know, but if you want to like put out a call, we can put in the, in the YouTube notes too as well, if anyone knows yeah. anything about, what, what was her name? Her name, okay, so my mom knew her as Helen Campbell, but her name was actually Ellen Campbell. And I think maybe her name changed over time because of her accent, so maybe it was misinterpreted as Ellen, but I think it was Ellen. Uh, hmm. But um, yeah, I know that she was in Montreal, probably t starting in 1929, probably as late as 1938, maybe later, because I think at one point she did go home to Jamaica. Mm -hmm. I don't know if she returned to Montreal after that or she stayed. So that's that's the problem. And I've tried every uh, corner I can think of. I've contacted historians and other mm -hmm. people recommended to me who might know. I know there used to be a directory in Montreal. I think it also was here in Toronto. I forget what. I don't remember it off the top of my head, but people might know, people who do this stuff for fun or for a living might know what the name of the directory is. I'm gonna say Lowry's, but I don't think that's it. I think there's another thing, but mm -hmm. I tried that to cross-reference her name and all that stuff. So it's interesting. Like once in a while I'll go back to it and then I'm like, no, nope, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, gotta love a family mystery. Yeah. yeah. I feel like someone needs to write a novel about her to fill in the blanks. <laughs> yeah. What was that, Vanessa? I was, I was just thinking about how it impacts your family and, and uh, you know, like what, what happened that they yeah. lost touch. And... Yeah. Well, I know that whatever happened, like my mom often asked her dad, my grandfather, and he got angry and he's like, we don't talk mm. about it. And it's like, mm. what happened though? Well, it's just something that happened. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I also find it's also. It's, it's weird because you, you sometimes see family patterns and, and things like my, it's funny because my great aunt left her home when she was 20. And then of course my mom, she left her home when she was 20 to go to nursing school in the UK. So I, I always find it, I like to see patterns like I'm always fascinated by patterns. Um, and it's just like, well, I guess it's a family thing, right? It's, it just runs through the vein of the, the family in some parts of the family, you know what I mean? So. Yeah, uh, Rebecca wants to know if 23 Me would help. Yeah, I've oh, I've done 23 Me. I've done Family Tree DNA. I did mm -hmm. Ancestry. Uh, I've done Family Search, which is the big uh, Ancestry website to find records. Uh, and I check there every so often because sometimes they will add more records. And sidebar to all this, I also happen to start finding family records for other family members. So I kind of built a little family tree of people that I know of. Mm -hmm. um so yeah it, it sort of it started with my aunt but it turned into this big thing it's like well I might as well do the dna tests it, you know with, take it with a grain of salt yeah, yeah um you know and also do the family tree thing as well uh and i'm also for anybody who's starting their journey uh facebook is great if you know like for example there are uh, ans uh genealogical groups like where, where i'm from in jamaica like there are parish uh facebook groups yeah, I'm telling you right now. She doesn't want to be found. Like, she just up a smoke. She's like, okay, I don't huh. want to this family. Like, she did have one ongoing bond with the youngest sister who I met, like, a few years before she died. Like, she was the only sibling she kept in touch with the team. Huh. But, yeah. <laughs> she was just like, nope. <laughs> Apparently, she didn't have any kids. Like, it, it's a whole thing. Wow, what a story. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Amazing. It's fascinating and infuriating. Well, I shouldn't say infuriating. It's more annoying than infuriating. It's not really infuriating. Yeah, to know that there was some kind of, like, something happened. There was some yeah. kind of falling out and no one would tell, like, people wouldn't talk about it. And so you don't know. Like, if people stop talking about something, the information does not get transmitted. Right. And you don't know what happened. <laughs> and there's, there's all sorts of stories people either concocted or they said that they heard that may have led to it like I heard a couple and I'm just like okay whatever like now it wouldn't be a big deal but I'm just like I don't know why this would be the thing that would make her up and leave her country on a on a boat you know um I, yeah 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 there's one other thing I was going to say that I found fascinating about this whole thing but it'll come to me later so. <laughs> I, I'm going to just quickly 
switch to fish vision the fish eye, because okay. the stuffing is happening. <laughs> it's happening very unenthusiastically. <laughs> Not Why? Is it still... Is it still it's just... I... I feel my crimes every time I touch it. <laughs> oh my goodness! Um, the stuffing is really, really good. I have been sitting mm. here eating it. Mm. It looks um, really good. Good. I'm really jealous, actually. I wish we could share smells. Shoot! I just yeah, realized this... I forgot to salt the inside, which I was supposed to do. Is it is it a, a, a salty fish though? Is it like a, a sea fish? It is a sea salty? fish. Yeah, it's probably not but... too bad. You left the head on too. Yeah, so it's, like, apparently it's supposed to. I don't know. No, it's gonna, gonna gaze at it. you reproachfully as you try and eat it. I know. <laughs> I'm not sad. I'm just disappointed. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Are you doing surgery on it now with the? <laughs> um. No. So the recipe says sew it up, and I'm like, <laughs> I'm not gonna buy a needle just for that. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I'm just tying it shut. Stapler, rubber clips. <laughs> <It's very laughs> binder clips binder clips are good for just about anything <laughs> so you do have a sewing machine you can <laughs> i do that is true i have one now um <laughs> i don't think i have a right i was right just gonna say pattern. um <laughs> right foot <Yeah. laughs> for your sewing machine. Yeah. sorry uh, diane your story is, is incredible and um actually i was just gonna say that um i love like oral history is kind of a passion of mine i used to do an oral history project with students and I always have them go and they'd be like, my parents are boring. And then they come home and be like, oh my God, my parents are crazy. And I actually, I usually tell kids to go and kind of record your elders talking. I think it's an yeah. incredibly valuable mm. experience. And you don't kind of it's, lose all these stories. Yeah, That's an I incredible do that. I, yeah, I definitely want to do it with my own mother. I don't know when I should do it now. Um, Cause she's almost like she's 81. She's going to be 82 uh, this August. And I like should do that. Um, I think they also the fascinating thing about it is that, you know, when you think about, I mean, I'm a kid of immigrants, so you always think that, you, you know, obviously your origin story starts with them and when they came to their country. But it's crazy because I like, can I actually say that it happened it started with my parents or did it start with this lady? Because she was here like, you know, 40 years before my mom showed up. So it's mm -hmm. like, you know, your ties, it, it kind of makes you wonder whether your ties to a, a country that, you know, you grew up in, but your, your parents adopted but you know and then you find out there's this other random relative that showed up it's like maybe my roots go back a lot farther than i think they do hmm. or a little bit farther back in my case and who knows what the story is right like if they could, right. she could just she could have, i don't know like you can't it can't even really let your imagine yeah. run wild about what she and, and, and it could and think. maybe it could be nothing like she could have just decided yeah. I don't like this life anymore. I need to, you know, find my own way. And I, I'm just going to go through this because I understand that they were sort of well-to-do in their community, like by rural standards. So to leave your, your family where you're doing fine and then you come here and you're working as mm -hmm. a domestic for another family. I mean, it's a whole class switch over too. So, I mean, there's so right. many layers to it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Huh. I just learned over the holidays when I was uh, – chatting with my mom and she had this letter uh from her mother's cousin i think and uh it, it was basically like i hope you're not going to be offended um i hope that we can still maintain our relationship and i was like what is he talking about and it's because my mom's been digging into her genealogy um and they've always thought there's always been this story that my grandmother's grandfather father uh was a sea captain and uh in in england and they sent their children over to canada because they were sort of well to do and they wanted them to have a good life in the colony or what have you um but they were actually um home children and he was not oh, a wow. sea, he was not a sea captain he was like he worked on boats kind of but was not a captain uh -huh. And, oh, wow. um, and my mom's been tracing, like tracing all of their genealogy. And it's just this shift in understanding what their that... life was and, and how they and, and what her past is. And it really it's impacted their current her current relationships, you know. And I was like, I didn't even I didn't know what a home child was. Um, I still explain don't what a home child is, is for because I've, I've heard that before. But in case yeah. the viewers, <laughs> the viewers at home don't know. 
Um, so they were, uh, I mean, and also if the viewers at home can correct me, I don't totally, I, I, I'm not, I don't have like a firm hold on this, but British home children were essentially kids um, that were, maybe they lived in an orphanage, maybe they were poor, you know, they were just sort of vulnerable kids. And they were sent over, um, I think that maybe there was programs in, in different countries, but they were sent to Canada and they went through these different organizations who would uh, teach them a tr like a, a, tra a trade. So to be a domestic or work on a farm or something like that. Um, I think the famous one was uh, Bernardo's. I think that was his, the, the, the name of the place. And um, they would get uh, they would get sent like as kids um, to go work on a farm in rural Ontario until they were 18 for room and board, essentially, or to work as a maid or, you know, things like that. Um, mm. And so instead, like the idea being that instead of this uh, sort of more kind of upper class situation, um, uh, they, she, was, she was a home child and was separated mm -hmm. from her brother and so my mom was trying to trace like where they ended up and stuff hmm. um, but it's a very different type of family history than the, than the history that my grandmother told my mother and all of her sisters and brothers well this is the amazing part of the story to me is that there was this whole cover story yeah <laughs> it was like yeah you know, this sort of like that the, people the, believed the in and, and that was yeah. important to them and it was like a, a like a part of their identity um, hmm. and I didn't really know any of those things and uh, it made me feel a little bit sad and disconnected that I didn't know those things. And now I have this other story. Um, in any case, they're still friends. My mom was like, of course, we're still going to have a relationship. You can believe whatever you want about the family. Like, well, she didn't say that, but he was essentially like, doesn't matter what you found in the records. Um, he was a sea captain. This was the story. This was reality. And that's the way that it is. Um, wow. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, wow. yeah. that's a really kind of profound statement and a lot of times about the historical record too you know like sometimes somebody finds out their father isn't their father you know and, and it's like it doesn't actually matter all that much like you can just kind of keep living or it breaks or it shatters everything right like yeah no it's such that's such a it's such an incredibly hard thing but I was thinking about like the way that even going back to the project that you're working on right now, Diane, about how people tell their stories and how they build their stories in their own minds and their own narratives and how we do that to be able to, to understand who we are, where we've been, where we're going kind of. Um, and that's, that's such a, I'm so curious about how you do that in your job, right? Mm -hmm. Because you are, are, you must build a narrative at the same time when you're, well, or, you're we, let, or you're letting it try and expose itself or I don't know. well it, with, I think with respect to this project like the narrative like we often fact check with the guests that we are featuring so I mean it's not up to us to build that narrative but like we hear a story and then we go to them to talk to them about so that we hear it from them in their words like from beginning to present day and so when we uh we try to do it in chronological order obviously uh so everything that we we sort of present is them is their story right so we're not we're not inserting ourselves in any way we're asking them the questions and then we use their answers the way that they choose to answer yeah if that makes sense I'm just going to parenthetically jump in and note that a cabbage has appeared oh, yes. yes before us and what is that what's the what's going to happen to it um Sorry. Um, the so the fish is in the oven now, which should take about yeah. roughly an hour, apparently, which hmm. seems like a lot for a fish. But um, I'm following the recipe. Um, so to kill time in between, I am making the salad that the book suggests you serve it with, hmm. which is um, cabbage, green pepper, sweet onion, tomato, mint, and then a lemon dressing. Yeah, that sounds good. It does. <laughs> A little bit less distressing to to butcher a cabbage. Yeah, I'm at home here guts. with this. Like you know, <laughs> no no slimes and yes. weird pastes <laughs> to take out. What what's the book? The oh, the book is oh, yeah. um. Oh, my hands are all wet. 
Well, you're while you're getting the book, we have a, a true left a, a note saying uh, since Puerto Rico is technically part of the U.S., uh, my abuela emigrated just by getting on a plane <laughs> in yeah. San Juan and stepping off. It is yeah the whole the whole American relationship to its territories is very confusing to me. But <laughs> it's an empire, you know. It's, it's confusing to us um, the house because we don't know what any of it means. This is the book. <laughs> Oh, cool. oh, 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 hold on. Um, hold on. Uh, let me let me just. Sorry, I'm slow, but uh, here we go. <laughs> yeah. Oh yes. Oh, that looks old school too. That looks like it's it is. The 80s or something. I love her author photo. <laughs> oh my oh, god, wow. that's amazing. Yeah. All right, go. God, I love it. That's yeah, I had to buy this book because my family decided oh, okay. to cut ties with its heritage after a certain point. See, so okay. Keep that straight. <laughs> I have to like research it as if it's a foreign country. Hmm. Yeah, you've got your own. I, I, I think we, we discussed this in a previous episode, but your family has its own complicated relationship to its history. <laughs> yeah. Very complicated. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Yeah, I had a um Oh, this is what I was going to say is that the the story about the uh the home child backstory um reminds me of the story and this is kind of like a half remembered story that I heard in the 90s, but you might remember those of you <laughs> who like me were around in the 90s and remember what happened. Uh there was this big like Celtic revival thing that was hot then and uh there was a family there's this person I knew slightly was was part of a family that um, they they had an Irish last name and they got really into their Irish heritage and they were like, you know, really they, they were like reading the, the books and they got into the music and they had like, you know, clothes and learning to do the dances and stuff like that. And then uh, the grandmother, who was supposedly the Irish immigrant, made a deathbed confession that she was actually from Sweden. <laughs> Why did she lie about that? I don't, I, it's like I said, I, 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 it's a long time ago I heard this story and I didn't get all the details, but it was just like their entire identity was uprooted and they sort of had to like re, you know, rewrite their whole story and they, they 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 basically sort of like they went through a period of shock and then they started to adjust and they like visited sweden and found the the, the place that their ancestors actually were from and stuff like that i always thought that would be it would make a good like small 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 budget indie comedy yeah <laughs> you know i love that like, her deathbed confession was that she was swedish and i, I love that she was i know <laughs> like I want a deathbed confession that is like, momentous and silly. Yeah, <laughs> like that's really aspirational. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Like, by the way, <laughs> my last deathbed name is very English. Um, Sorry? but it's because my grandfather. My last name is very English, but it's because my grandfather changed it. Um, in the twenties. And so, you know, when we when I visited sort of Scotland and Ireland and they always have, you know, Americans go there to try and find their heritage and people are like, so are you, you know, what's your Irish American heritage? And I'm like, I have none. I'm like, none, I promise. And they're like, for your last name. I'm like, no, we didn't come by it honestly. I'm named after a street in Brooklyn. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> like, <"Can> I? <laughs> yeah, I promise. I know, I, you know. I'm not interested in my Scottish heritage. <laughs> 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 my wow. great grandmother's family when they left well the russian empire at that point they changed their name to a generic one like the armenian equivalent of smith or whatever um because they were technically <laughs> criminal <laughs> not criminals um you know it was the russian revolution they were rich uh they were mm. fighting for the tsar so i'm not proud of that part you were on the um, wrong side they were on the wrong side. And whenever I, I made the mistake of saying that on Twitter once. Yeah, they were basically. <laughs> I, mean, uh, I made the mistake of saying that on Twitter once. People were like, oh, oh, so she was an aristocrat. And I was like, <laughs> but in like a way that implied that maybe she should have stayed and died, you know? <laughs> and I was like, look, I don't, uh, I don't, you, what are you trying to say here? <laughs> What are you implying that my twelve-year-old grand great grandmother is somehow culpable to the point of like she should have been in prison or something? Like, no, I don't think. Don't, don't say this. To... Have survived. Rude. Yeah, I mean, her parents are one thing. I mean, they were 
rich and they were definitely making their own choices in terms of mm-hmm. protecting that. But she was 12. <laughs> so. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's complicated. <laughs> It's complicated. It's so complicated. <laughs> and I want to. Are there are there more good stories? I don't know if you can share them from from um, from your kids, uh, your your students asking their families to you know delve into the, <laughs> the family well, background. It's just that they always like when they come back, they're always totally fascinated. So I used to do a family history project at a previous school that I taught at. Most of my students were first generation, and so all of their parents had a kind of a. Um, uh, an immigration story and they were always just really mm. and the kids would come back and they'd say you know my mom like she cried when she told me the story or you know it was really like emotional in a way that I think a lot of them weren't expecting and these are 14 year olds and I just remember it was like some of them were you know not as good because I made it very open-ended I don't ever say like ask your mom or dad you know, kids have very complicated families mm. um, I would encourage you to ask an elder in your community and talk to people and sometimes there were language mm. you have to translate so it was always it could be really involved but I just remember them saying you know they come back with kind of these really fascinating stories mm. um, and I, just, I can't pick up an example because this project was you know close to eight or nine years ago mm. but, um, I just I, I think it's a really important thing to get kids to talk to like their family and, and actually get the family to open up. Um, mm. Lost. I have recordings. We recorded my husband's grandfather talking about his childhood. And it's like a really kind of beautiful story. It's just sort of like England in the 1930s. You know, it's not like they had a lot of money, but he lives from a little town and he just had a really, you know, just that kind of thing. And I have, I've recorded other family members talking about sort of you know, things they've been involved in. I recorded my brother talking about the, the Banda Aceh relief um, efforts. He was out there um, with the US military and my aunt about sort of, she worked in the music industry in the 60s and 70s. And, you know, just a lot of those stories. And, you know, it's just stuff, stuff disappears. And um, I can be quite tedious about this, sorry, but I'm a big fan <laughs> of like history from below can really up yeah. experiences of this. And so, you know, when we're looking for historical narratives, one of the things that you have is the narratives of people who don't make it into the books and don't make it into the story. And yeah. so that's why projects like this are so um, profound. You know, I'm a big fan of StoryCorps. Um, they do incredible stuff. Um, and, you know, we have records because of the um, Works Progress Administration, you know, mm-hmm. in the 1930s, they went yeah. around with records of people talking, you know, who were born in the 19th century. And like, that's, that's you know, that's amazing. Yeah. They recorded all those folk folkways Smithsonian folk songs as well, right? Like yeah. the folk songs that were dying. Yeah. So much is gone now. Um, but we can keep so much more of it. And I think it's I think that's so beautiful. Uh, and mm-hmm. you can cover little bits of these stories um now with oral history. And I think that that's just I don't know, I think that's such a powerful tool and it's so democratizing because my kids all have like they all have a you know a, a recorder in their pocket and they can yeah, go yeah. stories and it's it's really beautiful and, they, and they're making something and they're making something original um, and learning about narrative and learning about connecting between personal stories and, and broader things, especially with immigrant mm-hmm. narrative, immigration narrative. Cause you're like, well, my family left, but you know, there was a reason there was a push factor. There's a pull factor. And, you know, immigration isn't this one way story that we've always thought of it as right. When people actually started to research it, they're like, actually no people went back and forth a lot. Huh? Okay. <laughs> so it's so mm. complicated in the formation of these diasporic communities is so interesting um so yeah i think i love that so much and um i haven't done that as much as my current job doesn't lend itself towards my current sort of Hmm. curricular thing doesn't lend itself towards that um anywhere near as much but i think it's I love it so much. So. What was the StoryCorps project? You mentioned that briefly and I've heard of it, but. Um, um, they just yeah. have like a tremendous number of recordings and sort of short interviews with people. Um, really interesting takes on sort of just people's experience. One of um, a lot of uh, stories of kind of African-American people, like the stories of them growing up. Um, in sort of the Jim Crow South in comparison, one guy talks about going from living with his family in New York to go visit his grandmother in the South and what that experience was like for him. And, you know, those records, it's so much more personal and real than just reading it in a book or looking at pictures. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. With audio stuff now. Uh, so mm. they're a lot better than they used to be. And I just, I love that. Um, yeah, I was thinking, I wanted to ask you, and you, you're kind of like answering this question already, but teaching teenagers about history right now, <laughs> like that's kind of, that's an interesting thing to be doing. And I'm wondering, like, what do they, what do they find interesting? What do they think is dumb? And they don't know why they're learning this. Like, what are, what's their take on it? 
<laughs> I mean, I'm a huge fan. Like, like I, you know, it's all about kind of making things relevant. And I'm not one yeah. of those teachers who is, you know, I'm pretty clear on like what is acceptable and what isn't, you know. And so I sort of get the start, you know, I'm like, we can talk about economic globalization. And that is a great, really quick topic to dive into. There's scholarship on both sides. There's lots of stuff, you know, we can dig into that. Um, but my line is always like, I'm not going to both sides you about Nazis. Like, we're not going to argue mm. about the right to exist people's right to their identities and people's right to exist in the world as fully realized humans. Yeah. Um, and that, I think that's the line that I draw. And honest, I'll be honest, like kids are better about that stuff than adults. Um, yeah. like, <laughs> the emotional intelligence, they're all, I mean, they're so sharp. They're so bright. They're so engaged. They know what's going on. You know, they care. Um, you know, like they're just, I like working with teenagers. I mean, I've sometimes wondered like, well, if I didn't teach, what would I do? And I'm like, but then I'd have to spend my time with adults. <laughs> <laughs> to a classroom with 14 year olds, like I've been teaching for almost 20 years and I'm like, I don't know what's gonna happen. Like somebody's probably gonna fall out of their chair cause they're doing something dumb. And it's funny, like, you know, they're great. They're so sharp. Um, Really, I would say that actually history is a field like we're on a real like, downturn right now. Like there's a lot fewer majors, places are getting rid of it. But I actually think that kids are looking for it because um, mm -hmm. they want explanations. They want to understand yeah. why the world is the way it does. Mm -hmm. and I think that actually like we're on a downturn. But I, I mean, I like to think this maybe because I teach high school and I love the subject. That I think, I hope like it will go back up. Um, <laughs> one hopes yeah we want it too. please <laughs> yeah you know i'm like you know we're all like you know there's so much but we're all the victim of circumstances you know and there's all so many forces that have led to us being in the places that we're in um mm -hmm. and that's you know and i just think that you know once you understand these things you're so much more kind of yeah, it's just it gives you a really a broader view. I'm teaching a class right now. Sorry, I can stop talking if I'm talking too much. Okay. <laughs> I, I asked you. <laughs> <laughs> find, um, an elective class uh, for junior seniors. So I'm teaching a class using um, Isabel Wilkins' book as kind of the backbone of it. Um, and so we're reading that, and that's a really neat book because it's history, but it's also narrative, but it's also sociology, but it's also like her personal experiences, and it's all kind of woven into this book and beautifully written. Um, and mm -hmm. so we're really doing a deep dive into the book and I'm bringing a bunch of other sources into it. And uh, the, you know, the kids are really like, they're, they're really engaged with the material. I get to, teach them. this is an independent school. Um, you know, it gets to be very current. Uh, I have to say public schools, like the kids are great, but the curriculum is really lagging. Mm -hmm. I think in a lot of ways, and I don't think that kids are necessarily getting like, <sighs> I love ancient civilizations. I think that's cool. <laughs> start what they're interested in you know we have to yeah. start where they are right now yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise they're just like i don't care you know like mesopotamia what? Okay. <laughs> um, and what was the book you just mentioned i'm gonna uh, put the title in wilkerson. sorry last by isabel wilkerson um, Past? a book about the warmth of other suns called about the great migration in america which is a really good book she's one of the surprise she's just a wonderful stylist and writer uh, she worked for the New York Times and the book is kind of an examination of sort of like the way she's talking about it is that like sort of inequalities are perceived through like we every country really I mean everyone has sort of a caste system um, and in America it's racial but in other countries it looks different and that's mm -hmm. um, sort of what she says so she says like race is the skin and caste is the bones. Um, and that's what the book is about. And she talks about India and she talks about Germany. She talks about America. And so I love it because it's really, it's a really, it's, it's just a really smart, compelling, interesting way of looking at things. Um, and again, it's, just, it's very current for that, you know, and, and it, it makes sense to them. So that, that is so important. Um, you know, and they can do anything later and some kids come in and they're like, I want to learn, you know, I want to do classics and I love that. You know, everything is mm -hmm. for everybody out there. But if I have a kid come in and they're like, I don't like the students am I doing? And I'm like, well, you know, let's like, I promise you French Revolution is actually relevant to today. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> or, okay, I kind of get it. And I'm like, see? See, I was, I unfortunately, I was, I was taught history very badly in high school. Uh, mm -hmm. it, was, it was, it was, it was really, really bad. And I just, I didn't, I did not. I I w did not come up with any understanding of why this was something I should be interested in. And I, I do feel that, I really feel that, like, yeah, the, the way to do it is to start with, like, give them a way in. And once they understand, oh, this is what's, 
there's a story here and it's relevant to my life. Then you can start sort of like building out the narrative and say, you know, well, you're interested in that. Now let's see how the French Revolution actually, you know, was the backstory behind this, <laughs> you know? And then if you go back even further, those ancient civilizations that you're like, why are we looking at this? So here is, here's the connection between that and the thing that you find interesting now. I feel I, like, I feel if that, if that approach had been taken when I was a kid, <laughs> but, yeah, I would have gotten into history a lot earlier. Like, also, like I don't think there's anything the multiple choice question that is worth answering for history mm -hmm. class. And again, like, there's people who use tests, and that's fine. I'm in all kinds of ways, but you know, I think as teachers, right? Like, I have to figure out. Most of my students are not going to grow up to be historians, but what will be useful for them in their lives is a sense of narrative, a sense of of history, yes. a sense of kind of mm -hmm. the ebb and flow of events, and chronology and ideologies that have dominated so that they understand like hey nationalism kind of started here and like and so that they understand that because once they have context like that to me you know the trump era was such an ahistorical period and in some ways that's kind of being repeated right now and it's like people mm -hmm. will you know like people you know will go to the u.s from guatemala and be like look you know and, and somehow be like guatemala should come to the u.s and it's like have you looked at the last like all of our well, all the stuff we did to guatemala like, like that was all, you can't just stand here and be like, I don't know what you mean. And it's like, but you no, know, we like ruined their country for 70 years. And it's that type of thing. And I'm like, you have to know these things because otherwise nothing that's happening now makes any sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm all really fun. Because I was like, because I just finished teaching a class where we were looking at American intervention, like we were doing American foreign policy. And mm -hmm. so I was bringing up one, what the hell? <laughs> like, this is insane. It it's kind of like you're starting to watch a, a, a long running TV series in like season 12. <laughs> and you have to, history is where you sit down and someone explains to you, okay, so in season one, in the pilot, this is what happened. And this is why these people are doing this thing. <laughs> That's actually, I like that. I'm going to steal that and pretend like that. That's a great way of <laughs> saying that. Yeah. That's really good. Uh, yeah. And as I got older, like as I've been teaching now for a lot more years, it's changed so much. Like when I came in, I was like, everybody should learn about Greece and Rome. And now I'm like, I don't like. You know, it's just, I don't even care really what you learn. You have to learn how to think. You have to learn how to read. Mm -hmm. um, you have to learn about you know like you were affected by these forces, whether or not you know it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, I'm gonna. That's a really important this. thing. Here we go. Look at that salad okay, happening. Salad. I I gotta say, like by the way, your knife skills are very impressive. Yeah, oh, thank yeah you. he's really like. <laughs> mincing these things. yeah that looks like a good knife too like it's actually yeah. sharp it is it was just a white elephant gift i really struck out or st struck out I hit the jackpot i don't know what am i trying to say <laughs> the, i don't play what's sports the, what's the idiom for that is yeah. that it's kind of it's kind of like a, a cold law what's happening up here a little, little bit a little salad yeah <laughs> what's that the herb that, what's the herb that you have on there mint mint oh wow mm, delicious yeah, it's sort of tabbouleh adjacent without the bulgur, I guess. Sounds refreshing. I It seems like it will be. I never had either of the things I'm making before, so we'll see. So it's going to be fish and salad. Is there another side dish? Uh, there are potatoes roasting with the fish. Oh, very nice. Yes. Yeah, I saw the potatoes and lots of butter. There was a lot of so butter. Much on butter. <laughs> Is there so much butter? Ooh. There is so much butter. There was a lot yeah. of butter. They were like, think, and I'm here for it. There's three tablespoons of butter. And I think the recipe is intended for a larger fish. And I was yeah. just like, <laughs> you know, why not? The stuffing's a little dry. Let's just add all the butter. Oh, how how large was the fish that you that you were starting with? Um uh, about like that and then <laughs> yeah, really yeah. skinny. Yeah, it, it's, not, it's, it's like, pretty. The one that fish. got away was this big. <laughs> <laughs> like, how much did it weigh, though? Um, I think it weighed a little under a pound. Oh, okay. So that's 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 not a large fish. This no. seems like a good. This Sorry, I, 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 I'm going to segue into. So you went to like a Whole Foods or something for the, to source this fish. <laughs> something along sure. I lines. mean, it wasn't Whole Foods. It was even bougier than that, but yeah. Right, right. But um, it had had it not been for COVID, uh, you you might have gone to, to Pike Place, which is, every time yeah. I look here, I, I learn about some new quirky aspect of Seattle. Like, Seattle is just like the quirk headquarters, the quirk capital of, of the United States of America. And so this is how I learned that there is a 
Pike Place is a, the, the famous fish market, and what it's famous for is they they throw the fish. They throw the fish across the room. You have to catch it. <laughs> Someone, because apparently, and I, I like Googled it and I went down this rabbit hole, and if you Google P Pike Place fish market fish throwing or something like that, you'll get like so many photos of fish flying across the market area. And I, yeah, there's this, I'll post the, when we actually have this up in YouTube and there, there are show notes, I'll post a link to that, but there's a Seattle times article about this where there's a video of them throwing the fish. And the story is that it's like, it's a big crowded space and it was taking them a lot of time to like go into the back room, get the fish, bring it out to the customer every time someone ordered a fish. And finally one day, one of the, one of the staff figured out they could just chuck the fish over the crowd and they all got very good at throwing fish and catching fish <laughs> and then it immediately of course people were like check this shit out so it became a tourist thing and now it's yeah it's the but as a customer you do not have to no no no, no, no. no. there's always somebody on the customer side of the counter to catch the <laughs> that was my question <laughs> yeah um it's... i love it i want to go there well, right really i want to go there too because they 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 are super conscious of being a tourist thing now in a lot of in really good ways actually because like they're using their fame to be like to be promoting sustainable aquaculture mm -hmm. that kind of thing which is great um but because people expect to see the fish thrown and if there's no fish being th you know no customers buying fish at the moment they have like lower quality fish that they're not going to sell but they just like hurl around so that <laughs> you get to see they're all bruised because they lost for. their eyeballs yeah they're all gross <laughs> and nasty but you know people want to see the fish being thrown so they're there's They've a, got their throwing uh, fish. The best place to buy jeans in Montreal. I actually don't know if it's still open because I don't live there anymore. But it's called Jeans, Jeans, Jeans. And <laughs> um, jeans, jeans. easy to remember. Oh, yes, jeans, Jeans, Jeans. And uh, there, it's not a tourist destination, but if you go, they will throw the jeans. So because <laughs> uh, it's very large, it's a very large place, and you go in and. The people who work there give you the once over and they know your size and the style of jean that flatters you the most like immediately. And hmm. then they just yell over to their compatriots at the other end of the warehouse and they're like, I need a lead boot cut. And then someone comes up with like a 28 waist lead boot cut and um, whips it across the store uh, <laughs> and you wait at the changing room. That's how it used to be. I don't know if it still exists. Wow. But. Have you have you purchased jeans in this fashion? I sure have. Yeah, <laughs> pretty good jeans. Pretty good jeans. I recommend. If it's still open, oh. I don't know if it survived COVID and stuff. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, Anna's just Anna will be right back. She says. Just um. So, um. What's that? Is it, yeah. That so I, I, I. This is one of those things where, like, Jared. Um, I think I asked you about it, and you were like, "Oh, it's just a tourist thing," you know, like the gum wall, and I was like. What? Well, it's the not. What? I mean, it, they are they are busy. People go there to buy fish all the time. It's yeah, just yeah. It, because it's crowded. I was thinking, I don't, I don't want to go there. But they also, probably would have had better options, but but also, but also, <laughs> I know too many people who've gotten COVID. I don't want to be one of them. Okay, but but Jared, the gum wall is what I'm saying. Oh, the gum wall. Did uh, I hear that? Did I hear that correctly? When you were like. <laughs> You know the other Seattle things, many other Seattle things. Yeah, it's it's one of the it's one of the Seattle things is the gum wall, which is also it's actually pretty just with within a few yards as the crow hops um, from the fish market, and you go as the, down as the fish flies. Yeah, <laughs> kind of under the under the market um, is the entrance to a theater that's right there, um, and that. There's a brick wall. I think it's the wall of the theater is covered with chewed gum. Um, and it started, I want to say, in like the 60s or 70s when people would be huh. lining up to wait to get into the theater and they would just stick their gum on the wall. Um, and now it's like, it's coated. No, that it's a, it's disgusting. A, it's a <laughs> lot of gum. It's um, truly disgusting. It, yeah, and it's higher up than you'd think it could get, but it, it's there. Um, and people like to sculpt it i don't know that's just gross but yeah uh, but yeah people come to see the gum wall now it's part of our heritage part of your heritage yeah <laughs> um there was a huge i don't know if i would say controversy but like it got cleaned recently i think in 2015 they pressure washed all the gum off <laughs> because it was starting to dissolve the bricks <laughs> um 
And then people went right back to sticking gum on the wall, and now it's back to where it, where it was before. Of course, it is. <laughs> it's so funny. It's not. I actually, don't even want to Google looks, that. It <laughs> looks as actually as kind as of cool. Neat, it looks like an art installation. Um, if you look yeah. up close, it's disgusting. But does it smell? Of, can you smell the gum? Yeah, it, it smell smells very <laughs> sweet. <laughs> so yeah. Pike Place mm -hmm. is really fun to visit. It is no. where the tourists go, but it's still, it's fun. Mm -hmm. I've been there well, in a while. I'm, I'm definitely going to come visit you sometime in the after times and see the, the fish soaring across the market space. <laughs> Stuff oh, the fish. Special. Have you ever seen Contiki, that documentary Contiki? No. Keep Wait. Meaning to. <laughs> is it the Swedish boat where they go over on the thing, was that it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I've heard of the Contiki. I haven't seen the yeah. documentary. It's a, it's uh, I think it's on Prime. Maybe it's not too long. It's an, and it's the footage that they took. It's this research team that um, built a raft, and they sailed. Is it around the world? Did they sail around the world? I think they just crossed the Atlantic. Across the Atlantic. Yeah. yeah okay. Across the Atlantic, and um, so, but they had a video camera. But I think the crossing was in the fifties or sixties, so it's silent. Um, but the the head of the expedition um, is narrating and is explaining things as you're seeing them in this black and white footage. And is it one Thor Heyerdahl? Yes. Yes. Thor Heyerdahl. Yes. Yeah. And um, one of the one of the things that he's narrating is how what they ate and flying fish would just fly onto their raft Whoa. and they would eat them. So they would wake <laughs> up in the morning and collect all the fish off the deck of their raft uh, and eat them. And then you see like, they'd get like a, a squid or an octopus and there'd be like the, the, I guess the historian of the crew would be dipping his pen into the ink into the ink sack and like taking notes. Um, it's really, oh it's my an God. incredible, it's an incredible document. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, really worth it. And they just use the, the currents to cross. So there's no power, it's just currents. Um, huh. So it's really quite, it's, a, it's really phenomenal. I remember this being like a big story, like when I was little, there were still books and stuff floating around about it because, and I think the idea was they wanted to show that humans could have uh, like basically reached South America this way from, yeah. Yeah. So, Which has since I think been disproved and uh, mm. through DNA. Is that mm. correct, Anna? You're nodding your head. They were, trying, yeah, they were but... trying to figure out how people got to like Tahiti or something. I don't remember mm. that. Yeah, like mm -hmm. if but populations think, could yeah. move across the country, yeah. like across the world, mm -hmm. essentially. Um, I think, and they I did say, like the I mean, they, they did it. Oh, yeah. that's a spoiler. Think, that's a spoiler. Was, Take that yeah. out. I think they turned out to be like Korean originally. Like that's where, they, I don't know, they were doing like oh. genetic analyses huh. of, of folks, but it was it was a surprise. Like it was a cool idea, but it didn't turn out. Yeah, that is a cool yeah. Yeah, yeah. I seem to remember like the genetics showed that they they had come from even farther away <laughs> than the Contiki theory oh, would have said. Okay. <laughs> yes, it was just like how the hell did they even manage? Uh, but yeah, some incredible ocean crossing with extremely minimal technology. <laughs> yes, yes. I'm trying but... to remember. I feel like at the I I may be misremembering entirely, but I feel like at the time the the Contiki was built, they didn't know about the land bridge or something, the Bering mm. Land Bridge. Yeah, so they were well. trying to account for how people ended up in the Americas mm -hmm. um, when there's so much ocean in the way. And then yeah, I feel like right after the Contiki, somebody was like, well, here's the land bridge. We've got <laughs> it's right there. I could be <laughs> very wrong, but like... <laughs> They do but know the migration know. follows Watching the bridge. Watching the footage, and I'm scared of boats. So, <laughs> and the raft, like the raft has the the water just comes into the the waves, hit the raft, come mm. in, float out, come in, float out, and so they're just it's just purely the power of the ocean that's carrying them. Huh. And instead of trying to fight it on a boat, they. That's that's what they're using, and there's it's just just something so lovely about that. Mm -hmm. I have to say. Mm. Even if their whole project, you know, was useless and uh, and, <laughs> and wrongheaded, but in any case, 
Um, it's still, still worth the 60 minute watch and the narration is really, really fantastic. Hmm. I'm meaning to one of my one of my New Year's resolutions, which we'll see if I keep or not, is to watch more documentaries this year. Because I always every time I do watch a documentary, I enjoy it. But I can't like I will never like choose a documentary. I keep like choosing other things. So I didn't choose it. It was for my family movie club and my sister chose it. So same. Family movie club. Yeah. <laughs> I'm curious, watched. what else have you watched for a yeah. family movie club? Uh we've watched so we take turns picking. Um, so we watched, I had to watch a like six hour documentary on Garth Brooks. That was <laughs> hours that I'll never get back. Thanks, Dad. I'm so sorry. <laughs> six. Oh. It's two episodes it's on Netflix. It's so long. <laughs> That's oh, more boy. time than I think he would need in a documentary. <sighs> intense like the it's beatles much. documentary is eight hours long but at least there's like you know they're the beatles and there's four of them <laughs> yeah <laughs> well I they're the no beatles like they're the beatles Fox was so you know i learned about that um we've watched uh uh king kong so we watched the 1933 one and mm -hmm. the one with young jeff bridges um and Dewan, which is like I st still one of my favorite character names of all time. It's not Don, it's Duan. Um <laughs> <laughs> we watched uh I can't remember what it's called right now, but it was it's um it was a movie about um this lady who would watch trains and she becomes she's like a crotchety lady and she becomes friends with the driver of the train and it helps her like reconnect with her life. So hmm. yeah, that was a French movie, a French film that we watched. That was good. Um, we've seen, oh my gosh. Uh, my sister made me watch, what was it? It's like Keanu Reeves and Ethan, no, not Ethan Hawke. Keanu Reeves and somebody, some sort of murder movie. Hmm. And it was very bad. That was very, very bad. <laughs> we had to, my nephew chose Thor Ragnarok, um, which I had seen in the theater and enjoyed. And I have to say, it's very funny, but like also Thor is a very tragic character. I never mm -hmm. really thought yeah. about it before until like I watched it around that time. So we had like, journey. we talked about Can family we... trauma during the discussion. So that was like an intense thing. Hmm. Um, I don't know. Well, I don't know. We probably watched like 20 movies or something like that. Um, <laughs> if you want my current favorite movie, it's Pacific Rim 2013. Oh, <laughs> Pacific Rim. Totally That's underrated. Beautiful father-son relationships good. and like meditations true, and, yeah. daughters, and also robots that fight sea monsters like and it's, <laughs> cut it all. Say, it's like it's such, such a huge movie. scale but it's shot so well you see the fights it's incredible it was so good. there's moments in it where I, my, I watched it on an airplane a couple <laughs> weeks ago and i was like <gasps> like my, my jaw dropped at a couple of moments it's my current favorite movie um it was like less than two hours which is like exactly my speed <laughs> my mother will show that movie to guests who come over she'll be like really? have you seen pacific rim yeah <laughs> which is even funnier if you know my mother and i know nobody here does but it <sighs> was it something yeah. she just watched by accident and then she's like no nope. have you seen pacific rim like <laughs> no we um um i think i saw it in theaters and i was like <laughs> I, I um, some of my sisters, I think, were still young enough at that point that they couldn't like go by themselves or something. Mm -hmm. um, so I was like, "Mom, you might actually like this. Who knows? Let's go. Let's go see it." Um, so we went, and it was actually a terrible viewing experience because the 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 projector was too dim, and they had cropped it. Some this was like a Regal Cinema, so they should have known better. But it was too dim, and it was projected so that the subtitles were cut off. Like you get half of oh. the, if oh. there were two lines, you get the top one. Um, but she liked it enough through that, you know, all those hardships just to get it on DVD when it came out and start showing it to everybody. <laughs> she knows. This is wonderful. This is wonderful. Is What's no every, everybody's mom's, mom's favorite movie. 
Um, Maybe they Ned had they have a monkfish every week. Every time you go there, they have a monkfish just like lying on the ice, like hanging out into the crowd, and it's just disgusting. And they don't throw it; it's just there in case anybody wants it. And it's hideous. Did I show? I can't remember because we were talking about this when when we were all logging on before we went live. But um, Vanessa was talking about uh, deciding against thinking about, but deciding against uh, cooking a skate. And I just wanted to show everyone what a skate looks like. It's like, <laughs> it's like now, it's now like that I was drawn again, by a small child. I just watched <laughs> The Matrix Resurrections last night, and there's one of the, there's a character in there that is definitely based off a skate. <laughs> now that I now that I see that there, um, I was just gonna say I um, uh, my mother's favorite movie was Mad Max Fury Road, um, but really yeah. nice. <laughs> I found this amazing like aggregate of just like horrors that Russian fishermen have found. And when we were back <laughs> in home school for a couple of weeks at the beginning of January, I was like, look, I don't want to be here and you don't want to be here. So we're going to spend the t first 10 minutes of class just looking at fish with like human teeth. And so we did. Oh, uh, that, that, I hate those. That creeps oh. me out. That, oh, I like I, I, I always say like, I'm, I'm horrified. Like, I love the ocean, but I'm also like terrified of her. And uh, <laughs> it's like, we don't know what's under there. You know, we don't, we don't. It's so mm -hmm. scary. Have you ever seen that little fish that gets rid of parts of its body? It's like, it's luminescent. It gets rid of parts of its body and like throws it away to, so that the predators will chase that part instead of their whole body. I don't think I do about that <laughs> one. I don't like it. <laughs> no. <laughs> They sure will, are uglier fish. They are if they are a half, like they're tr like a dead one, just kind of hanging out off the ice, like it's trying to it's, with slack jawed, with, like it's trying to escape. It it's pretty gross. That's pretty nasty. <laughs> no, it isn't the most horrifying fish, but it is the most horrifying one to come across suddenly in a market. <laughs> like the crowd parts, and there it is staring at you. It's not great. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Like, like this. <laughs> the gooey duck is one of. I don't really know how to say it. G Are we gooey gooey duck? Duck? Yeah, gooey yeah. ducks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, I didn't bring I it up this things. time. <laughs> I hate them, but they're amazing. We talk about these like basically in every and they episode. come up every time, just organically. This is a There are there yeah. are mascot. <laughs> They're a oh. disgusting, obscenely shaped mascot. <laughs> First time I saw one, I just I was like, I don't, I just, I can't, I can't. Like, I don't understand what this is. I don't like it. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't like it. Nope, don't like it. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't, I've never eaten. I don't eat shellfish. Um, I, I, like, would you? Are they like? Am I missing a taste sensation? No, you. I, I've never had one. Oh, um, okay, okay. But because you've seen them in the wild. I'm not going to cook you. one because they are very upsetting. I'm not <laughs> going to, I'm not going to, if somebody else prepares it for me, maybe, but I'm not going to get one and cook it. But I do, one of my favorite things to do is go out during low tide because, you know, they're native to the Northwest. Um, oh. Just go out on the beach and you can see them. They're, they're, well, they're not little, but their giant necks just kind of rise out of the sand. That's <laughs> uh, 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 there. I would freak out. <laughs> it's so weird. And if you step on them, they squirt you. It's, Oh, oh no! Wow. And you don't necessarily know that they're there because they're usually under the sand. So if you step near them, they squirt up water and shrink into their sh or try to get into their shells, but they can't because they're too big. So, and if you're very still and very quiet on a northwest beach at low tide, you can see the clams just like shooting water up out. Of it's really funny and it's also really upsetting. <laughs> yeah, we just yeah they somehow have come up like. Almost every episode for one yeah. reason or another, because they're also just they're very. They're, I don't yeah, know what they, they, they look they like. They look like a body like part. Me? They really do, <laughs> like a very large body part. <laughs> and they have a little like like shell, like sort of around one one bit. Yeah. I mean, they're yeah. they're a nightmare in the gym. like they're nightmare creatures. And that's what I love so much about Pacific Rim is it all it's all of my nightmares really made flesh. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In a format you can deal with. <laughs> yeah, because there's a lot of fighting them and that makes me feel better. And Idris Elba is there. So, you know, I know nothing bad will happen. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. I could, honestly, one thing that I could, like, look at pictures of all day is uh, life that is, like, 
as far below the ocean as humans have got with cameras. Like they're really they're really mm -hmm. weird things. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> like in this total outer space, completely alien world that is like four miles below the ocean. It's Wild, fascinating. Mm -hmm. I saw. Anyway. I went to uh, Woods Woods Hole. Woods mm -hmm. Hole. I think that's what it's called. Yeah, Woods Hole. yeah, Woods Hole. Um, is it the? It's like one of the deepest points. It's not like uh, what's the what's the deepest point of the ocean that we can the go Mariana to? Mariana Trench. Yeah, it's not the Mariana Trench, but it goes pretty deep, I think, Woods Hole. And they have a little museum, and you can go and visit the inside of the Alvin, which yeah. is like the the little spherical, oh, yeah. um, bathy sphere, diving yeah, sphere that dives down, <laughs> and inside. They have um, audio recordings of the people inside the, Al the Alvin the first time they went down, um, just explaining and talking about what they are seeing. And uh, I, when we listen to it, I, I just I just burst into tears. It's like it's mm. such a beautiful because uh, they're, they're seeing these things for the first time. No one has ever seen these things, and they're just trying mm. to describe it. And you can tell that they're they're they can't quite they can't quite articulate what what's happening inside them mm -hmm. it's really if you're ever in Massachusetts Massachusetts that's a tough word to say um <laughs> it's, uh, it's worth the visit worth the drive to Woods Hole, <laughs> Woods Hole. Dan I didn't hear what your mom's favorite movie is oh I don't think I said um I was trying to think I'm like what what because like she loves older movies and, and the one the only one I can think of is sort of a running joke between the two of us, which is uh, Papillon, not the one that came oh. out a couple of years ago, but the original one with Steve McQueen. Oh, um, because I've never seen it. Yeah, no, it's fascinating. It's like, I mean, it's based on a real story and a real person who, strangely enough, like passed away like uh, the same year that the remake with Charlie Hunnam came out. Hmm. If anybody cares. Um, <laughs> But he's a basically a, like a, a French, uh, I guess, I forget what he did, but he's like convicted and he's sent to this to serve his sentence out on his island. And the, most of the, the movie is him trying to figure out how to get off the island. And he's always getting punished and he always ends up in the hole, like in solitary confinement or in jail. And he's there for, I forget how many years, it's a long time. And of course, throughout the course of the movie, he's always like, I'm still here. <laughs> Well, sometimes, like, I'm asking my mom, like, how are you doing? She's like, I'm still here. <laughs> I'm or she'll ask me, and I'm like, I'm still here. <laughs> like Steve McQueen. Yeah. Right on. Okay. Wow. Mad Max Fury Road, Pacific Rim, Papillon. That's quite a selection. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if I yeah. would, I don't know if my mom would say that's her favorite movie. But I think it's the one that she feels she needs to evangelize for whatever reason. Because <laughs> <laughs> I think she assumes everybody else has already seen Singing in the Rain or whatever. Mm -hmm. so. okay. mm -hmm. Which they probably haven't. But <laughs> but have you seen Pacific Rim? <laughs> but have you seen Pacific Rim? <laughs> have you? <laughs> I'd like to be in that conversation. <laughs> just imagine him popping up and knocking on the door like a Jehovah's Witness and just saying, have you seen Pacific Rim? <laughs> I never watched the sequel because I was like I was too scared it would be awful, and I it enjoyed the good. first one so much. Mm -hmm. I heard it was good. Okay. It, it, had, it had like some. It had some moments, but it wasn't overall. It was just like it was pointless. Mm -hmm. and it was, really, really silly, even for it, a it, it, yeah. Great. Mm, that's a bummer. Yeah, Vanessa. It, did, it yeah, seems like a good time to ask you. Paro, and I didn't. Sorry. Hmm? Sorry, we did that like. <laughs> Zoom thing where you both started talking at the same time. Sorry, mm -hmm. Anna. <laughs> Go ahead, Anna. Oh, I was going to say it didn't have Guillermo del Toro, so I didn't want to see it because oh. I love him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I agree. Um, Sorry, and I was going to ask Vanessa to, to, this seems like a good time to jump into your golden age of detective fiction. Oh, I don't know if anyone was, like, I don't know if that's like interesting to anybody except for me. <laughs> I'm just like obsessed with it right Jared, now. Jared wrote a film uh, noir, uh, hard boiled detective story set in Fairyland. <laughs> Ish, yeah. Really? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. Sorry, I was distracted. I was looking up the internal temperature for fish done. <laughs> Good. It's, it's a good thing a couple to know. minutes left. Yeah, I want to hear this. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I'm just I I've always loved Golden Age detective fiction. I only thought there was Agatha Christie, and now I know that there's like 
a gajillion other authors out there that I didn't know about. So now um, I've taken them, all of the ones I can get my hands on out of the library. And I think, so like, um, this one is, I just finished this. I yeah, loved it. Cross Seas. And who's that by? Well, Carol Karnak. Okay. Carol Karnak. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, so the British Library has an imprint where they've started reprinting all of these Golden Age detective fiction novels. And I don't know, I think maybe it's part of the pandemic, but I like, I've really been enjoying just going into a different world. And I think that these, I feel like it's such a huge, they were so popular and they were so huge. And there was such a wide variety of different authors that were operating that when you, Hmm. when I've, now that I've started reading them, it's sort of like I'm learning about this whole time in history in a way that you can't Hmm. get otherwise because it's reflected sort of naturally through these novels. Um, So like, uh, like in this one, there's a group of 16 people that go on a skiing holiday together. Um, And they're traveling just after World War II out of England. And the way that they describe it is like, it's like this steamy, gray, dirty, slushy, freezing cold, foggy London. And then they're heading towards this like idyllic, snow covered, freezing Austria. And, but they're talking about it, not as just as an escape from the the weather, but also an escape from uh, like post-war rationing and not being Mm, able to eat the things that they wanted to eat. And um, the women uh, are uh, like the group of girls, the group of women that are going all live in this house together, which I was not a living arrangement that I knew anything about. Um, with like a house mother kind of, except for their working women. Um, so they've all gotten together to go on this trip and they're all kind of trying to figure out um, uh, what their working situation will be because they've lost their jobs that they had during the war. Um, so it's just like, I don't know, there's just something, and that's not even, ha- this doesn't have anything to do with the plot really. Um, but I just have really been enjoying uh, learning about this time as reflected through these novels, which is kind of weird. <laughs> and also I joined this book club. So it's fun to just be on this board with like, I'm 38 and there's like younger people and then there's like people in their 80s in this book club. And we're all kind of discussing the same, these same themes and we all mm. kind of are into the, the adaptations the language, um, the biographies of the women who, because it's a lot of women who write these books. So that's mm-hmm. also kind of an interesting thing as well. Like it's a, and, uh, and I love a puzzle. So I like to figure them out too. Um, and the food. So I've also been now learning <laughs> more about uh, the food that they talk about. So that's why uh, I was talking about um Victorian recipes and 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 that's why I was going to try and cook skate because it was mentioned in this Victorian recipe book that I looked at um and I tried a dessert omelet because it was a murder weapon in one of these novels that I just <laughs> okay we need, we need more information about that <laughs> murder by dessert omelet yeah. <laughs> so there was like so much that I didn't understand about this meal um because they had it. fish and chicken in the same meal which just seemed Sorry, like like a wild amount of protein to have in one meal yeah Um, yeah it's it's very meaty these these like older older menus are all like here's some meat and a different kind of meat and some more meat (laughs) indeed yeah like it was like super intense and then so okay so there's two people they're having dinner they're friends and then they he starts talking about how they each make their own omelet at the table so it's like an omelette à table. So, <laughs> and uh, it's sweet. And I was like, I never even heard of that before. Like, has anyone ever heard of a dessert omelette before? No. Yeah. That's a- yes, from, you have. from like a Victorian cookbook, not not from yeah. reality. Um, so anyway, the guy had uh, the guy had built up an immunity to arsenic and put a bunch of arsenic um, in the omelette. Um, and then made sure that there was a big group of people that had eaten everything else in the food so that they wouldn't think that the poison had come from the food. Very, very clever, but not clever enough for Peter Whimsy. (laughs) I just, I did read Body Nights, which I enjoyed a lot a couple months ago. 
I love Gaudy Night. Yeah. I just read Gaudy Night recently. I was thinking there's a TV show they did in England where they had people living in different time periods. And it's called uh, Supersizers. And there's one where they eat sort of late 19th, early 20th century food. And it's like this insane amount of meat. And this is the part where she has a duck. And then you'd get another, you'd cook two ducks. And then you'd put one duck in the duck press. Yes. <laughs> you stuff the duck with a duck. <laughs> and he squeezes duck juices on the second duck. It like sounds, sounds incredible. I would eat that. I'm not going to lie, but I regret it. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> well, I highly recommend a dessert omelet. I made one the other day. And oh, yeah. So how did that go? <laughs> it was delicious. I made brown butter. Ooh. Uh, and then you make it real hot, real quick. Um, and then I put cinnamon and apple butter in it. And I rolled it up and it was very hot, very sweet. Cinnamon, brown sugar, and apple butter. And cooked so in brown butter. Basically it, kind of like a crepe, but without flour. Yeah, basically. A flourless crepe. Yeah. <laughs> I think the guy, and you're supposed to cook it like in a chafing plate, which I didn't know what that was. Um, but it's it's basically like when you go to um, a Holiday Inn and you get breakfast and all of the breakfast foods are in those mm-hmm. like tin things. With yeah, the, the, little, the little oil <laughs> yeah. burner things underneath. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I did, I, but I never heard that word before. So I learned that, um, but I didn't have one of those. So I just made it on the stove top. But it was quite delicious, I have to say. It feels like a bit weird to eat three eggs, a bunch of brown butter, and sugar um, for breakfast. <laughs> but... Jared, how is it looking? Um, it's looking like a cooked fish. So that's a good sign. Did you, did you measure yeah. its temperature? Did you take its temperature? Or... I did. I did. Was it the right, the right temperature? Ooh, look like at this. I love this part. The big reveal. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh, flaky. Mm. That looks incredible. Yeah. Oh my god, I'm so hungry. <laughs> <laughs> I think really the key here was you put so much butter on it that it couldn't really go wrong. Yeah, it's, mm. it's going to be moist no matter what. Mm. Potatoes. You left its head on, but it's... I did. It didn't say to of, take the head off, so I was it's just sort like, of hiding... The eye is kind of hiding under a potato. So well, no, but that's a good thing, because yeah. what happened to the eye is actually very disgusting. The it exploded. Yeah. It, exploded. It, it, it kind of... You know those turkey timers that, like, pop out when the turkey's done? Yeah. It's a little bit like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah, are you gonna we always there's always the part where you actually eat it and we yeah. gauge your reaction in terms of whether you seem to actually be enjoying yourself <laughs> well i mean if nothing else the stuffing was really incredible so mm. i can just snack on that if this is gross uh, it looks delicious like i want to make it i just made yeah. my partner go in because i couldn't find skate so i'm going to make lobster um <laughs> But I should have made him get me a fish and I could have tried your recipe. Yeah. I don't know. I just was Googling dessert omelets and I kind of want to make that for dinner. <laughs> uh, and, you know, British people. Ooh, this is really, really good. It looks so good. Nice success. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the What's was the fish it? like? Is it like flaky, buttery? Yeah. It is, it's flaky. It's also very, very soft, which mm. I think is probably because of the butter. Mm. Forgot to put lemon on because you're supposed to do that. <laughs> there are, I have to say, some unidentifiable bits in here. So I think I wasn't as thorough as I should have been. <laughs> with Next the time you get the fishmonger to, to get the fish. Yeah, um, I'm not doing that again. <laughs> <laughs> Except for in some sort of post-apocalyptic situation. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's very soft and buttery. And the, the filling is sort of sweet and savory because it's got the, you know, it's got currants in it. And you, when you cook the onions, they become kind of sweet. Uh-huh. So, okay, that does sound fantastic. Yeah. Oh, it's really good. 
Okay, we'll stop. I'm just gonna ourselves. sit here and eat for a minute. Wait, what? <laughs> don't, don't look <laughs> at me. Always, this is always the hard part of this stream: is Jared enjoying food that we can neither eat nor smell. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm sorry, but not that sorry. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> he seems like a pretty, good, like a very able cook. Have there been any catastrophes? Like yes. inedible? Okay. It wasn't so much inedible as just structurally unsound. Oh, the, so many the, bones. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. There was, the, there was the attempt at baked Alaska. Uh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> what I is had baked Alaska? Kitchen after I tried to make that and no baked Alaska. <laughs> what what uh, is that? Baked Alaska is a cake with a dome of ice cream on top and then meringue all around. Oh, okay. All over, like covering it. And you're supposed to... First of all, I believe I was making this in the height of summer. So it was a bad idea already. Um, but the ice cream wasn't very, wasn't solid enough to work with. So it all kind of melted. The cake took longer to bake. So it made, it made the ice cream melt. It took longer to bake than it should have. So the ice cream just kind of melted. Um, so it was like a, it ended up being like a cake with meringue and then a really nice ice like cream sauce. <laughs> sauce. Yeah, it tasted really, really good, but it wasn't, wasn't as it was yeah. supposed to be. The only failure I think I've ever had was the soul cakes that I made around Halloween. They were because amazing. those, they smelled really good and they tasted yeah. fine, but it was a little bit chewing gum-esque trying to eat them. So oh. hmm. they were supposed to rise. They didn't rise. They were just like flat grayish kind of oh. lumps. Yeah, they weren't. I didn't realize because they looked pretty. <laughs> you took a photo of them and they, they looked They looked very... very pretty. I just realized I didn't take a photo of the plating before eating all of this. Eh. <laughs> You'll figure Guess something out. I'll just out. have to plate up some more. Fish. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you still got the head. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank God. I wouldn't want to be without that. <laughs> there are a lot of bones in this thing. That's more than I was hmm. expecting. Are you going to throw them out or are you going to keep them? Don't people don't make like yet. stock and that kind yeah. of thing? I don't know. Yeah, but typically you want to make stock out of something that hasn't been flavored. Oh, um, right. And this is covered with like pine nuts and breadcrumbs and currants and things. So <laughs> I don't know how. I probably still will, but we'll see. Or there'll right be now a very just... happy cat somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Jared, had you made fish like before frequently i mean this is a this is a full full on baked head on fish but is is fish something that you cook regularly or is this kind of a yeah cuz i don't i don't eat a ton of meat so when i do cook flesh it's generally fish. some kind of fish but it's not like this it's like a kind of like a packaged fillet yeah. or whatever yeah 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 a fillet mhm mm like most of us yeah, I was, just, I was just thinking. I think I have like a frozen salmon fillet in the freezer, and yeah, those are <laughs> now I am inspired. Mm -hmm. I cooked one of those for dinner last night with polenta, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which was also very good, and didn't involve gutting anything. <laughs> <laughs> the first time I ate a whole fish was um, I, when I did the um, the Compostela, you know, that walk across the north of Spain. Oh, oh. Um, I did it with my mom. And um, we, we, we started in St. jean pied de port in France, and then you cross the Pyrenees, and that's your first stop. Right? And um, the first stop is in, uh, uh, now I'm going to say Roncesvalles, because I live in Toronto, and I can't remember what the French pronunciation is. Roncesvalles, <laughs> I guess. Um, uh, so you get there, and it's like this big monastery, and there was a huge snowstorm. We were there in May, but there was a huge snowstorm in the Pyrenees and I lost my mom. And it was like this super intense, we were not dressed for a snowstorm. Mm. Um, and you're walking like 30 kilometers through the mountains. Um, so we were just like completely overwhelmed and I had lost her. And it was just like this, she was freezing. She was coughing. She was crying. She got a cold. Oh, no. I was like super stressed oh, no. out. I'd like, gone and back to try and find her um in the snow and luckily someone had found her and kind of guided her towards the um towards the uh the refugio the big monastery place and um but it had just been so snowy and so windy that we had lost each other and we couldn't follow the tracks 
Hmm. So it was really scary. And then you get there and you're in this like giant big um, monastery and with just like stacks of bunk beds with a whole bunch of other stinky people who are also extremely miserable um, <laughs> uh, from just having done this like super intense walk. And you wait in line, have a shower. We try and change into whatever dry clothes we have. Um, and we get to the meal. And so when you do the uh, when you do the Compostelle, there's all these places that make a pilgrim's meal. So it's like a, a three course meal for very little money. And we hadn't had one yet. And so we sat down and they served us this whole fish. And it was so beautiful. Like it had its head and tail and it was like this delicious looking meal. Um, and it was this, in such an intense wave of like gratitude for this hot, fabulous food. Um and come down from this emotional experience. But also, I had never eaten something with so many bones before. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and it was like, uh, my mom and I were just like, we were trying to figure out all the Europeans around us were just like, <laughs> no problem. Um, and we were like, we didn't understand how to dissect this fish. Um, and uh, so it was like this it was it was kind of like a metaphor for what we had kind of gone through she was like I just want to be able to eat this <laughs> it's so wonderful and I worked so hard to be able to get here and do this thing and now we're so sad and we're so miserable but we just want to put it in our mouths and, <laughs> and it's delicious but it's also hard to eat it was like yeah. <laughs> it's just like this whole kind of like myriad of, yeah <laughs> <laughs> of emotions that we just centered on these two whole fishes anyway but it was delicious <laughs> That's, that was the first day of the Copacella. we're coming up on on two hours which is which is when we're, we're going to close out but i just remember the the fish the the talk of fish made me remember anna i want to hear the story about seeing a man catch oh, a fish yeah. with his bare hands <laughs> I live in, uh, in South Brooklyn near the Verrazano Bridge, and there's a great place to walk down there. And we were walking down there, and people fish down there. I don't think I'd eat anything out of the New York Harbor, but, like, whatever. I'm, I'm not a huge fish fan. And I, I saw this guy, young guy, just uh, balletically kind of vault over this, the, 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 the fence, climb down the boulders. You climb down the boulders, grab a fish out of the water with what seems to be his bare hands, smack it against a rock and then just kind of take it with him and leave. <laughs> and was, like, bunion or whatever. I was so impressed. I was like, I am married, but honestly, like, I regret that decision. <laughs> really do something. I mean, it was, it was, it was amazing. And I was so quick that like uh, my husband and daughter, we were walking together. Like they were like, they didn't even notice it. And I was just like, man. <laughs> um, this, is, this to me is also a very well new york is still new york story <laughs> oh, yeah, folks doing stuff and having a good time um so but yeah i'm still like i'm still just very impressed by that man um you know if i'm ever single i'll be down by the water looking for him so, uh, <laughs> i mean again you know where to if, find him. when when civilization collapses, I bet he also knows how to clean that fish. I bet he knows how oh, to clean no, that fish. that's not even going to be a problem. The man can do it with bare hands. Like, he knew exactly <laughs> what was going on. Yeah. What a that's guy. Amazing. Rebecca says, thank all, thanks to all of you for being so interesting. You Well, thank you for, for oh, sticking awesome. around and <laughs> watching Indeed. the fish happen. <laughs> um, I know I want to go try making it now. Yeah. And a dessert omelet for dessert. <laughs> More protein with your with your protein. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh! Any clothing thought? Cl clothing? Any closing thoughts? Things that we didn't get to? Questions about the family? The sound is really good too. Oh. I forgot oh, to yeah. say. Yeah. <sighs> I'm not sure. I only have one. Have, what are you going to have for dessert, Jared? Sorry, sorry, Dan. No, go ahead. You go first, Vanessa. Go first. What are you going to have for dessert? I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, question. the obvious answer is a dessert <laughs> omelet, Jared. 
<laughs> yeah, it's, what was it's that? very satisfying. Yeah, uh, uh, this is Rebecca saying I weirdly always love watching Jared. Eat at the end. It's, it's very satisfying, you know. It's, it's it's a whole narrative arc from the horror of the disemboweled fish to, you know, the contentment of eating something. Yeah, <laughs> covered in butter. Yeah, there's a lot of butter. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I just, I got to go in one sec, but I just wanted to share that I just found a job listing for um, an, an, a 50 acre island off the coast of England called Peel Island. And you have to live there for 10 years. There's only about four or five people on the island, but you run the pub. And uh, hmm. I don't know, if I'm, but I'm feeling like I would really like, like, I, I, I would like this job. Um, yeah. <laughs> just living a beautiful 50 acre island. It's going to be cold and wet, but like, there's no people there. It sounds amazing. And you have visitors on Peel Island because I would come and visit. Yeah. Yeah. No, like, uh, I'm trying to get a terrain shot of this place, what it actually looks like. Oh, I mean, there's no trees and it's in England, but like, it looks pretty nice. <laughs> oh, yeah, and there's, there's worse, like, worse ideas, man, in COVID times. Um, Is it one of those British islands that are kind of in a, in a Gulf Stream or something? So it's ridiculously warm because it has warm water flowing around it? Or it must be windy if it's got no trees hmm. yeah I, <laughs> yeah like there's the that island <laughs> it doesn't look great we helped we clean her house <laughs> <laughs> great work okay, happy to so help <laughs> exactly this is the, the easy way to help uh so i'm going to end the broadcast there those of you on the stream you don't have to leave right away where you can we can hang out a little bit longer but um we're going to say goodbye to the people watching. Thank you, those of you who like hung out to the bitter end and saw the eating of the fish. Thanks for sticking <laughs> Thank <you>. around. <laughs> and we will see you next month with something. I don't know. I don't know what it'll be, but it'll be tasty. I do. Does anybody <laughs> oh. want to sneak in? I'm going to make a princess cake next time. I've decided. Ooh. I don't know what that is, but it sounds you good. Heard your, you, exactly. you heard it here first, folks. Yeah. I don't know what it is either, but we are going to find out. Tune in next time. <laughs> Until then. <laughs>